Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, before I get started, read the following statement. May I remind everyone present this meeting will be broadcast live via the internet and the recording archive for future viewing. Move on to item one on the agenda. Apologies for absence. Gareth? Yep, Matt, Councillor Nick Hodges and Councillor Christine Cave. Thank you. For no other apologies for absence, I'll move on to item two, minutes of the last meeting. Move the minutes. Thank you. Uh, finally, uh, before we get going, uh, receive any declarations of interest. Item three. Anyone have any interest to declare? Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have item four, site inspections from our last committee meeting. Have to move those. Move those. Great, thank you. Uh, item five, um, delegated building regs applications. Move the notes, thank you. Uh, item six, delegated planning applications. Move and notes. Uh, item seven, appeals. Vicky, do you want to say anything on appeals? Thank you, Chair. Um, so we've had three new appeals uh, that are on page 34 and just two appeal decisions, both of which are dismissed. One relates to an extension to a barn conversion. Several issues there. It was quite a large extension to the barn conversion, which is contrary to our policy. There was no evidence submitted in respect of appropriate alternative uses, and also there was an issue with ecology, and the inspector supported us on all of those issues, so that one was dismissed. There was also an enforcement appeal relating to uh, the material change of use of land from agriculture to garden and the erection of um, some buildings for a yoga shed and a patio service area. This was out at Marcross. Um, slightly unusually, it was only um, determined under the appeal under a ground F, which relates to whether or not the... Um, uh, provisions of the enforcement notice go too far or unacceptable. They didn't actually consider the planning merits of, um, of the application because no fee was pursued in that regard. So the inspector concluded that the enforcement notice was appropriate in respect of the um, matters in the enforcement notice to remedy the breach. So we, we won that appeal as well, but um, we may well have some further planning uh, applications on, on that one. We'll wait and see. That's all, Chair. If there are no comments on the appeals, have someone to move and note those? Thank you. Um, item eight, uh, trees delegated list. Move and note, thank you. Uh, move on to item nine, planning applications. Begin with planning application 2017 slash 00395 slash FUL, Brooklyn's Retail Park, Culver House Cross. Vicky. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you to members who attended the site visit this morning out at Brooklyn's Retail Park where we were able to have a look at proposals. We're just going to get the plans up on the screen. So in the meantime, I will uh, refer you to the Matters Arising report. We've had comments here from the planning agent who I believe is also registered to speak shortly. So um, those are for members' attention and the officer, officer's report dealing with those and we can discuss those further as part of the debate, I think. Um, so the proposal here is for a drive-through um, A3 coffee shop type use. Um, the application forms do identify the uh, future occupiers as being Starbucks, but it wouldn't be limited. It's not a personal consent that's being requested here. Um, so it's essentially a, a drive-through uh, cafe type coffee shop. Um, located at the uh, northern side of the um, existing retail park. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with this retail park on the edge of our um, county council area, right by the Culver House Cross um, uh, traffic directory. The existing um, car park provision you can see on the plan up on the screen, and then if we can see, this is the layout where the proposed restaurant um, uh, cafe use would be with the drive-through facility wrapping around the building. Um, it uses up uh, a large area of the existing car park and the report refers to the loss of, I think it's 57 parking spaces. I refer you to page 41 of the officer's report. Um, and that is the main issue I think that we'll be considering here tonight. The, the recommendation is for refusal um, on the grounds of loss of parking and the resulting implications for highway safety on the adjoining highway network. Um, I think that's all for now probably, Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, we don't have anyone registered to speak 
uh, against the application or any members of the Bellingham Morgan Council to speak on the issue or not on the planning committee. So I'll invite Mr. Ross Bowen of RPS Planning and Development. If you could take your seat up there, please, sir. Um, when you're ready, you'll have three minutes. Just turn your microphone on to speak. Okay. Thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, councillors. My client acquired the Brooklyn's Terrace Retail Park in 2011, and at the time it was in a very sorry state and in need of substantial investment. They worked closely with the council to set out their plans and vision, and the proposed investment was welcomed. My client has made good on their commitment with a multi-million pound investment into the retail park, and the proposed Starbucks is a key element of this programme of improvement and so it is naturally very disappointing for the application to arrive at planning committee almost a year after submission with a recommendation for refusal. It's particularly disappointing that the first time highway safety concerns have been brought to our attention is in the committee report. There has been no fair opportunity to address these points. You will have seen our letter detailing our concerns about the officer's report and the proposed reason for refusal, so I won't go into detail here, safe to say I would like you to consider the following points. The committee report confirms that the proposal is acceptable in all respects bar parking and highways and has not been subject of any objections from the general public. The proposal represents a significant capital investment into the retail park with the creation of many good quality full and part-time jobs. The officer's application of parking standards in the report repeatedly confuses maximum with minimum, contrary to national planning guidance, which is explicit that maximum standards should not be treated as targets and that there should be discretion to allow developers to reduce parking levels. The scheme is only 16 spaces below the maximum level identified in the committee report. This is clearly not deficient. The parking standards carried out were robust and in line with well-established methodologies and the suggestion that surveys cannot be re relied upon until all units are occupied is unreasonable and commercially unviable. Forecasts show a short-lived maximum parking capacity of 79% of the all spaces. This would not lead to congestion on impacts of the highway network. If it were ever needed, there is substantial queuing potential inside the site to accommodate vehicles before any spillage onto the highway occurs. And customers, of course, are quite able to choose alternative locations or to vary the time of their visit based on their knowledge and the circumstances that they're likely to expect. These are simple decisions we all make on a daily basis. These materials are, are highly relevant and no evidence has been offered to justify the assertion of highway safety implications. We would also suggest that you require officers to explain precisely how the proposed development is contrary to policy MD2 or Planning Guidance Wales. We simply do not believe that reference to either substantiates the proposed reason for refusal. I'm afraid that's uh, three minutes. Thank you, sir. Um, before you step down, has any member got any question of clarification um, for Mr. Bowen? Um, Hi, Mr. Bowen. Um, have you any figures to sort of how many cars will be going through your um, drive through per hour? Um, they are provided in the transport assessment. I'm afraid I don't have them to hand, so I can't give you this precise figure at the moment. Okay, with that, um, if you want to step down and we'll, uh, we'll move into the, the main body of the debate. Um, Councillor Bird. Thank you, Chair. Um, as local member, I was the one that requested this come to committee. Uh, and I would like to say that um, although they're not on record, I have had many public complaints to myself who, as I sit on planning committee, I am here to represent. Um, I admit that the Culver House Cross um, area has been poorly um, run over the last few years and I appreciate that uh, it is now starting to come to fruition. But unfortunately, um, <clears throat> Aldi has a very high footfall, relatively new 
um, kid on the block. We have um, planning permission granted for a B&M uh, store to, um, and their license is currently being looked at, um, to uh, go in there very shortly, and there is another empty unit. Now, if you care to go down to this place on a Saturday, um, especially busy, you know, bank holidays and things like that, you will find the car park now is pretty full um, with very few spare car parking spaces. My concern, uh, and it is a grave concern, that with B&M um, and some other tenant in the other unit, there will not be enough parking now, let alone with the loss of 57 units. Uh, we all know how congested Culverhouse Cross is. Um, the, the junction itself only needs the slightest bit of traffic on there, and it causes chaos right through Cardiff on the A48 and the A4050 into Barry. So I, I just cannot accept that this will um, have no impact. I'm afraid I will be listening to everything that goes on tonight, but I'm going to take some convincing that losing 57 car parking spaces, when I drive past it every day, I shop in Aldi's as well, I know how busy that car park gets, uh, and when B&M go there, I am convinced there won't be enough parking currently. So uh, if you want to try and convince me, you can, but uh, I'm not convinced as yet. Councillor Thomas. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm, I, I, I literally have no, no, no dog in this fight at all. I, I have no, no axe to grind on it. But in terms of people's behaviour and parking at this site, I would suggest that the people who park, the people who go and shop in B and M, and the people who shop in Audi are one and the same, and that, you, and that by and large, you'll have double visiting rather than people going just for one visit to one store. So. Um, trying to sort of sum those together, I think, is probably a misleading way of looking at things, uh, as, as I'd assume the customers for the one are the same uh, or similar to the customers for the other, and you're going to make one trip and visit, the, visit both stores if you are uh, that way inclined. Uh, it's just an observation. It's not a, not a proof. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think perhaps um, um, maybe if officers could just help me with the um, this 40% uh, reduction in existing in, in car parking spaces according to the the maximum as a result of linked trips. So I'm just trying to um, get my. I was afraid I wasn't able to attend the site visit this morning. So I'm trying to get my head around the um, the use of um, you know minimum slash maximum parking standards numbers. Um, and, and how that impacts of, upon this application. Because on the one hand, we have what would be the standard amount of parking spaces for this site. Um, that has been reduced in the, according to the report and according to some of the um, appendices that we've recently, um, the additional two we've received by 40% as a result of the, um, the use of a, um, you know, a linked trips, um, um, uh, whatever, whatever. I don't know how that's been, exactly why that's been calculated at 40%. And then the figures that have been uh, suggested here, um, suggested by the applicants, are several in in um, a short of, of that number. I'm just wondering what um, what weight we should give to those those three different sets of numbers. So I'm trying to understand why the 40% has been um, implemented in the first place is probably my first question, and then understanding you know what level that other numbers then have against that. I think would be helpful. So some officers' advice would be. Um, welcomed. Can I also um, ask if you could just, obviously, in addition to Councillor Johnson's points, there were some points raised by the agent with regards to technicalities. I'd like to iron those out, but I think most of them are covered by Councillor Johnson's questions. Thank you, Chair. I'll try and address the, the parking issue, um, so bear with me. If I can perhaps refer members to page 52 of the officer's report where this uh, issue of the 40% reduction is dealt with. So I believe that was a figure that was put forward um, as part of the uh, applicant submissions, that it was a reasonable assumption that there would be 40% linked trips. So that's, um, you know, building on Councillor Thomas's point that you would potentially have the same shoppers going into one or more of these retail parks, at, uh, retail units at any given time. And 
that's where the 40% reduction comes in and that's a reduction based on the maximum standards. As the planning agents pointed out, um, you know, maximum standards are just that. We have this conversation, it seems, every month at planning committee about the application of our parking standards and that they should be treated as a maximum rather than a minimum. That's in accordance with Planning Policy Wales. Um, and so it is always a case of balanced judgment and, and that we um, have to consider whether or not the parking provision is adequate to meet the needs of the site. And in this case, it's in the retail park in as a whole rather than just the, the Starbucks unit, just simply because we're losing a load of parking that's already serving the existing units. Um, our uh, highways colleagues and Mike's here. If you've got any particular technical questions for him, but the, but they um, felt that the forty percent figure was a reasonable um, reduction. It's fair to say that's not set down anywhere in any sort of law or guidance. It's just that's deemed to be a reasonable assumption. It's also fair to say that the parking guidelines, you know, they're they're, they're just that they're a guideline, um, and these retail units and their parking demand can change, you know virtually overnight if the user changes um, and, and the consents are relatively open in terms of the, the vast array of end users that would go in there and I'm sure um, anecdotally you will hear the impact that Aldi has had on, um, on the sort of busyness and vibrancy of that retail unit and we saw that for ourselves on site today you know on a on a Thursday morning and, and the car park outside Aldi certainly was um, was pretty full and and it's obviously become a popular store um, there are currently two vacant units on the site and then there's the Curry's PC World unit um, and to be fair to the applicants they've tried their best to look at um, current parking surveys around the Aldi unit historic parking surveys around the um, the previous uses and the Curry's um, current use and they've tried to am amalgamate those into a, a best fit really if you like in terms of what the, the parking demand will be. Um, our concerns are that um, that there simply isn't going to be enough parking if we allowed this that there um, would that it wouldn't meet clearly the maximum standards um, but in but in doing so it, we're not saying oh unless you meet the maximum standards it's going to be unacceptable we're saying that in this case in this location given its proximity to Culver House Cross and and um, the importance of that junction in terms of the strategic highway network, a junction that is already at capacity and, and forecast to continue to be so into the future, um, that any overspill of traffic as a result of the lack of parking on this retail park is going to cause problems for um, for the adjoining highway network. So um, the, the agent's point, I think, uh, raises a concern about highway safety issues not being raised until now. Well, I think that's a bit disingenuous because we've been talking about parking with the agent for many months now. And, and the reasons we're talking about parking is because if there isn't adequate parking, there's then highway safety implications as a result of cars having to queue, congestion issues, cars maneuvering um, within the site and, and on the adjacent highway network simply because the car park is full up and they can't get in. And one of the points that we raised on site today, and I, I believe it's covered in the, in the report as well, is you don't actually appreciate how full this car park is until you are in the car park or at the entrance to the car park because the way you approach it, whether you're coming from the Barry side or from the Culver House Cross roundabout side, you can't actually see the car park because it's at a higher level than the road. From from the Barry end, it there's the Pizza Hut restaurant, which is basically in the way. And so you can't see, you can't appreciate that the car park is full. So this idea that customers will arrive close to the site, see that it's full and just drive on and not go there, I don't believe in reality that will happen. Um, customers will join the back of the queue to get into that lane because of the, the way the highway works and perhaps Michael will have a bit more technical wording to what I'm saying but essentially you know you get to Culver House Roundabout or you come from the Barry End and you pick a lane to go in and if you're going to this retail park you pick to go in that filter lane and you may join the back of the queue of that filter lane without realising that the queue is as a result of the car park being full and there not being the ability to go in there. Um, so I, d I don't think it's quite right to say, oh, this will all iron itself out if it's full, people will move on and it won't cause a highway safety problem because I think the reality is that it will cause a congestion problem and that in itself is contrary to policy MD2, 
uh, criteria six, which talks about development having no unacceptable impact on highway safety, nor cause or exacerbate existing traffic congestion to an unacceptable degree. So coming back to the agent's point about what particular part of the policy, that's clearly the part of the policy that we feel this application is contrary to. Um, I think that's probably addressed all the points. Sorry if it was a bit of a waffle. If I uh, bring in Councillor Parker now. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I've got a lot of sympathy with uh, Jonathan Bird's assessment of the traffic problem. I use that junction a lot as well. And if by any chance there was a traffic hold-up of people turning into that uh, retail park um, in volume, mm. the problem would be, would be considerable. However, this morning when we were there, all the delivery vehicles actually end up by having to go to the back, but a large delivery vehicle came and actually produced a problem which was not apparent to me until I saw it, that the, the exit routes from where the delivery is for this one actually go through the car park, and the car park's laid out as a car parking layout, not as a, a, an area suitable to take fairly large delivery vehicles, and I welcome Michael's uh, view on uh, w whether just by allowing large delivery vehicles is going to exacerbate the problem which we all recognise is there. Michael? I'm not, uh, not aware of the problem that you've identified, but obviously um, a any, any issue in relation to deliveries, uh, particularly arriving uh, during uh, the times when the car park is being used at its peak period, will, will exacerbate the problem and could, uh, could cause additional congestion and problems for traffic uh, either entering or leaving the car park. By way of clarification, what I'm saying is that the, it, it appears to me that delivery vehicles will have to come out via in front of Unit 3 uh, and then be in a delivery, you know, looking at a delivery vehicle. That would be quite a tortuous, if not impossible, way, way to get out. Um, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave that for other judgments. Thank you. I, I have a question with regard to um, traffic light sequencing, if I may, um, Mike. Um, in terms of the, the amount of traffic that comes out onto the road from the retail park, uh, having used it a number of times, and then today as we left from the site visit, the, the space to come out and turn to go into the Vale or to turn to go out into Cardiff, doesn't with the yellow box and the through road as well, how much could that be extended? Um, I understand these may not be traffic lights controlled by the Vale, uh, and I just wonder to what extent um, the highway is always going to win in that in that argument about how much time there is to get back out. You know, so they haven't necessarily seen how full the car park is, and then it's going to be quite a while before the traffic potentially goes back out onto the onto the onto the main highway. Yes, well, uh, as members are probably aware, the um, uh, the road network in that area comprises of uh, something like three different sets of lights. There's the, the, the set of lights at um, the Carvhouse Cross Geratory, uh, the lights at the entrance to the retail park, and then further up um, uh, um, at the HTV junction. Um, so uh, all those uh, uh, traffic signal junctions uh, are, are linked together. Uh, and they're, um, they're operated under a scoot system, and the scoot system will work to optimise the movements through uh, the junction uh, as, as best it can, um, actually manually changing uh, any of the uh, phasings or, or, or timings is, is uh, something that we would um, uh, not recommend. Uh, it could... You, in, unless you fully understand the implications of what, what that uh, manual adjust adjustment can do, the scoot system is there to try and get the optimum out of, uh, out of the traffic movements. It will uh, monitor traffics in traffic movements in terms of the and, and, and traffic queues in terms of the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the loop detectors that are in the highway. Um, so uh, whereas there, there potentially is uh, an opportunity to, to, to vary timings, particularly um, Cardiff, they would uh, they would monitor that uh, that area for us. And if there was a significant issue, uh, they do have the capability of, of manually changing times. I would suggest that that, um, that, that wouldn't happen unless there was a, 
a significant issue occurring, but you know the the scoot system should should deal with um, uh, traffic flows uh, under most conditions. Albeit, if there were was queuing out onto the um, uh, onto the main road, um, then there's a potential that that queuing traffic could be interfering with the uh, detector loops, and that that could interfere with the operation of the signals. Thank you. Um, Councillor Parker. Uh, if I could come back, if I could get Vicky to put PL02 up, because there's another concern that I've got. Yeah. That's the, that's it. Now, if you look at that, all the traffic, and, and, and uh, if you like, that side of the park is the least traffic part. Mm. But once you start bringing the traffic out in front of Unit 3, I can see major problems with all the disability parking, because mm. that's the way that the, the the uh, delivery vehicles will come out and also the car the traffic that's going to be or the parking that's going to be to the north on that plan is also going to come up so it's going to be major chaotic problems um, but not only with the delivery vehicles and with with volume officers have any comments on that well i think i'm Councillor Parker makes a good point. Um, clearly, if we were looking to approve this application, we would be looking at things like um, delivery traffic management plans and things like that to try and ensure that delivery vehicles were coming and going at a time when you wouldn't expect the other units perhaps to be open or certainly not during busy peak times. So um, we could probably address that issue through there. But um, yeah, I don't think um, I don't think it's been looked at in in that detail in terms of whether or not the larger vehicles, the swept paths and things, would interfere with with that those parking spaces. Councillor King, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm I'm minded that the that the diametrically opposite um, on the GRA tree, the the, the mark, basically Marks and Spencer Tesco. I seem to remember they had to do quite extensive remodelling of their junction to help. Uh, cope with traffic flows some years ago because of increased footfall. So I suspect that that will become a knock-on effect um, as this one I evolves. Because the, the, the thing, I, the, the developer made the comment about the maximum standards and the report talks about you know the, the, the maximum number of parking spaces per internal floor area and all the rest of it. And I, I can understand that is a maximum. But this is an out-of-town shopping area. There is no easy way of getting there there's no active travel method. There's no buses as such. It's not the sort of retail you're going to go 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 to by bus or any other make means. And it's, they talk about driving. So we are we are we're not talking about any alternative. We are talking about cars, a lot a lot of them. And I and I, I have to say I think the, the the traffic flow around the car park that might that might be something that could be remodelled. But the sheer volume, I I think we're going to have major problems at that junction as we did at the at the egress ex, uh, whatever it is in in, in out of um, Tesco. Councillor Lloyd, next. Uh, yes, just to pick up on the point about not uh, about potentially customers not able to to make a decision as to whether or not the car park is full before they kind of you know make that decision. Um, you know, you see, I'm not an expert, so this is just a, an observation. But in multi-storey car parks, you have a similar kind of issue. You know, so you can't tell whether there are spaces. So you have the signs outside saying number of spaces left. Is that not a sensible mitigation for, 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 for that problem? Just forget the volume for the moment, but, but dealing with that problem. Vicky? Um, I guess it would be for the applicants to propose a form of parking management plan um, to convince us that this could all be managed and that it wouldn't cause those highway safety issues, but that, that isn't in front of us. That hasn't been proposed. Councillor Johnson. Thank you uh, again, Chair. I, I'm a little concerned to um, to hear that some of the areas, such as you know how access would be done for um, by the uh, deliveries, etc., has not been considered already as as, as part of this, because um, this is a an existing uh, retail park. Um, so, I mean, the the issue for me here is what is the impact of this particular um, change upon the you know the wider um, area because you know this already exists these the problem not many of the problems are already there or thereabouts in one form or another so 
what is adding this Starbucks here going to do to that is is the question. Um, I, 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 I appreciate the, the, the point that, that Councillor King makes that um, that people would, would have to drive there because you know, it's not the sort of place you're not going to go all the way out to Culverhouse Cross just to go to, to a drive through Starbucks. Yeah. I'm fairly sure most people who want to go to Starbucks anyway can find somewhere else. I'd much rather they use somewhere independent uh, any, in a town centre anyway. Um, but that's not the point that, that's being argued from a, from a planning perspective here. So I'm, I'm trying to understand that the, the reason that we are, uh, it has been suggested that it is refused is because it is um, s essentially 16 short of what we've accepted as being the maximum parking standard size for this area. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I just wonder, you know, sort of in terms of exacerbating problems, et cetera, et cetera, being 16 short. I mean, does that mean that if this was 243, if they're able to remodel it so that we only lost 40 shot, um, 41 spaces rather than 57, would that mean this is the maximum and therefore acceptable? I'm just, just trying, to, I'm trying to understand that, you know, that them being a couple short of the maximum um, and therefore, the, the, any, any problems that come as a result of that are the reasons for refusing this. That just seems a bit strange to, uh, that being so, so close to our maximum, because um, that's what going to be watched. I mean, 227 to 243, that's what, more than 90% of our maximum seems fairly close to the numbers that, that, that we consider the highest of our parking standards. That, that just seems a bit strange that that's the reason. If, if it was being so close to that maximum parking standards, leads to all sorts of problems on the road, um, then I, I just, that just seems to, that just jars with me because I don't understand how being so close to the maximum can lead to so many problems. If that is the maximum, if we have a couple more in there, are we saying that's going to reduce any problems that there would be outside? And this is, this is an existing, um, air, this is an existing park. Um, so the problems that are, uh, many of the problems that are around Culver's Cross are pre-existing. To what extent is this exacerbating it? And that's really my, my, my query is, well, what more? What, what, if they had 243, would that make this acceptable? If they had 240, would it be acceptable? So where's the, where does that take us? Yeah, no, um, Vicky, would you, or, or Mike, would you like to come back on that? And then I've got a couple of councillors. Um, I think it oversimplifies the issue to simply refer to this standard or that standard. The standards are what they are. And I, I, I would just draw your attention to that 16 gap also is taking account of all the parking which is over in the Burger King unit and for those that were on site this morning it's very clear that that but that unit is tucked away at the back of the other site it's not at all obvious to customers accessing the site that that's an obvious place to park if you want to use the other units on the retail park so um you know I think it's it's it would be um well I would be guarded against entirely taking account of all of that parking because I, I in reality I don't believe that customers would notice that the, the the retail park they want to use is full and therefore go looking elsewhere for this parking at the back of the site but that to one side you know um it's also taking into account the parking surveys and and the the idea of how full the car park is going to get so the standards are one thing parking surveys in are another and there's been quite long drawn out discussions and debate about the um, adequacy of the parking surveys because the retail park has never been fully occupational, certainly in recent history, and not with the units that are now coming forward, the Aldi unit that's open, the B&M unit that's going to be open. So, um, you know, there's, there's a, a whole degree of doubt about that. And, um, you know, we've considered and thrashed out all of these issues and come to a balanced recommendation which we feel actually to lose 57 parking spaces here mm. is going to cause problems in terms of the part the future parking demand for the retail park and the likely knock-on effects then for queuing maneuvering and overspill onto the adjacent highway causing um, congestion and, and and we consider that this is a step too far i think it's an impossible question to answer what if it was this amount or that amount? What we're looking about at is what's in front of us, and we've judged that this is an unacceptable impact. Okay. Coming really quickly on that as well, and, and you have to notice where this one is. Now, some people will be aware of retail parks all around the area where there are long access routes into it, and when they get very busy at Christmas time or other busy times, often cars park on those access routes. Um, 
I suppose it's quite a good example was Marks and Spencers just up from here where you used to get parking and congestion all up that access road but before you ever got to the point where traffic was backing back there was a lot of there was a lot of parking and a lot of access roads where you could stop cars the difficulty here is that um, you're almost immediately backing up onto the main A4, A4050 as soon as you're going into the park there is no there is no run of access road that you can stop on and pull up and and so the location of it in its own right makes it very difficult sec i think the other point which um uh, councillor johnson point asked about was deliveries and why suddenly this unit makes such a difference in terms of deliveries and and obviously it's because it's on its own it's a, it's it's a way all the other deliveries for all the other units they happen through a separate route which was designed into the, the the park when it first started but because this is actually accessed through the car park you will have deliveries to this unit going through the car park itself as opposed to any rear access or any alternative access for delivery so that is why deliveries have been talked about i've got councillor bird next and then councillor burnett councillor bird Thank you. Um, I still remain unconvinced. A um, couple of points I'd like to come back with on the debate. Uh, Councillor Thomas says he thinks most of the customers are the same. Well, obviously B&M um, have a different opinion to Aldi because as well as Aldi having an alcohol license, B&M are also having an alcohol license and s sell very many similar lines. So um, I, I do question that. Um, Councillor Johnson, I would challenge you to go down there, um, currently actually, uh, before B&M go there, and count 57 spare spaces on a bank holiday Monday or a Saturday afternoon. Um, but when B&M go there, I can guarantee you there won't be 57 spare spaces. The network, the road network as we know, is way over capacity and one the slightest little hiccup causes backups, and as we saw when Five Mile Lane was closed, backups all the way past the airport, uh, backups down towards Cowbridge on the A48, and backups into Cardiff on the A48. So that junction is very, very sensitive, and that's why I am not prepared to take any risk with the traffic on that. Um, I'm, I've got nothing against Starbucks, and if this application was around on the other business park, um, the other side where there's a lot more room for parking i would have no issues at all but uh, unfortunately i am not convinced that there are 57 spare parking spaces when b and m go in there and there is another unit there we don't know what is likely to go in there so sorry i i still remain unconvinced councillor burnett thank you um when I first looked at the application, I thought, well, you know, they're shoehorning Costas or Starbucks into virtually every retail park that, that is in existence at the moment, sometimes both of them. Mm -hmm. um, but then, as a lot of people have, have raised, the issue of the loss of car parking spaces came up. I don't think I'd have as many concerns if it was just shoehorning it in, but it's that loss. And I... The, my concerns come from the fact that the road infrastructure in the Vale is incredibly fragile, particularly on the boundaries with Cardiff, because these are primary routes where people are trying to get back and forth. We see quite often the Leckwith interchange with the, the big retail park there. At certain times a day, it will take you anything up to three quarters of an hour to get from the, the roundabout at the bottom of Leckwith Hill up to um, Soper Road or Broad Street. If you try to get around, to get back to Panath on a, a Sunday at certain times or other times by the Asda roundabout in Cardiff Bay, when people have decided to go out shopping to that retail park, there's no point. The other day I actually drove, drove up to Leckwith and came back <coughs> into Panath via um, Leckwith and Landock. There was no way that I could get back to Panath that way. And that is the, the, the size of and scale of, of the traffic that is going into retail parks. My concern is that if we have people, because even if you put signs up saying whether it's full or whatever, we all know the people that drive in and drive round and round and round because they're convinced there must be a parking space for them somewhere. 
or the people that will queue on a main road just in case someone comes out. The impact on Culverhouse Cross, the potential impact, when at the moment it is still a main route down to the airport and enterprise zone, um, and when things happen quite often gets very, very busy, I think is probably a step too far for me to, to actually look at the, the way in which our roads could become completely over capacity. So if, if it wasn't for the loss of, of parking spaces, I would probably say, well, you know, it's, it's modern living, but losing 50 odd spaces in, in um, a, a, you know, a modern retail site where you're actually going for growth, you want more and more people to go there, is, is probably tipping the balance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bird. Okay, thank you all. I think we've had a good debate, so I'd like to move that we go with the officer's recommendation. Uh, thank you. I've got Councillor Parker next. Uh, I'd second that. I, I would also like to point out that I also use the 4050 quite a lot to get to the Alps. If for any reason you decide that you're not going to pull in there because the traffic is backing up and you go straight along, you've actually got to go all the way along to the Alps on a, on a single track or a a two-track two road, mm. turn around at the roundabout and come back. So the chaos that would be caused on a busy day would be uh, far worse than we could ever really accept. So I would second uh, Councillor Bird's recommendation to accept officer's recommendation. Thank you. There are no other points. I'll move to a vote um, as it's been moved. Uh, all those in favour of officer recommendations? Thank you. All those against? Um, any abstentions? I think we're okay. That uh, uh, passes with officer recommendations. It's uh, not approved. Moving on to our next planning application. Our second and final planning application today, uh, 2017 slash 01263 slash FUL, land off Jarlston Road in St. Athen. Um, Marcus. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is a, an application on 0.6 of a hectare of agricultural land. Um, it is for 18 uh, affordable housing units, which are nine of which are two bed, uh, five three bed, and four one bed flats in a single block. Um, all accessed via Gilston Road um, and obviously consequently then the junction with the uh, the main coast road. Um, this site, if you can see in the uh, executive summary, has had objections to it from local community council. Um, we have looked at this and there are a number of issues which have been raised. That the key issues are in respect of access to the main settlement of St Athen across the coast road and obviously the other issue which ha has come in via a late representation um, from uh, Friends of the Earth is in relation to um, the ecology. Um, uh, it does mention a number of issues, but the main issue is uh, ecology sorry, uh, and the loss of agricultural land. Um, so really, really quickly, in terms of the uh, access to the site, um, You'll notice in the report it has been addressed and has been considered both by highways colleagues and by planning. And the issue is that obviously there's been a development on the other side of uh, Gilston Road to this development, uh, an affordable de uh, development of affordable homes. And as part of that development, there were improvements made to the crossing of the main coast road. Um, our highways colleagues have looked at that and consider that um, those that crossing is considered suitable and uh, will meet the requirements of these additional houses. Uh, moreover, it's a 40 mile an hour road. It's been limited to 40 mile an hour there, so that combines to make the uh, scheme uh, or the crossing that exists acceptable. And there isn't a need for an additional um, controlled crossing at that point. Um, and in respect of the issue of ecology and possibility of door mice, you'll notice in the report um, the issue of that issue has been addressed. Natural Resources Wales have been consulted along with the Council's ecologist. They have, uh, Natural Resources Wales have raised no objection and have considered the information submitted with the application sufficient. Our ecologist has not raised any further uh, 
objections and has advised if natural resources Wales are uh, accept, find the scheme acceptable they they consider it to be acceptable um, planners have taken the view that we will do a belt and bait belt and braces approach and above and beyond what we are required to do we have applied what's known as the three tests to uh, related to ecology where we uh, consider um, if it were uh, an ecology e ecological significant site were there would there be sufficient planning merit to outweigh that and allow the development to take place and that is in the report as well and it does conclude that even if there were uh, species such as dormice on the site then um, subject to satisfactory licensing by natural resources Wales then it would be acceptable in any event so well, there is no evidence of any uh, protected species there however we have done a full assessment and consider that on the basis of that the scheme would be warranted on um, and considered acceptable um, there are all the other normal planning policy considerations have been considered in the report including um, the fact that the site is in the countryside and that there is, uh, it is on agricultural land, and it has been weighed against the policies within the LDP, and therefore a recommendation has been made. But one final point, which is can be a little bit confusing, because it is 100% affordable housing, um, the we would not normally seek to have a Section 106 agreement or legal uh, agreement to secure additional funding on this. And you will notice that there is a recommendation of a Section 106, and that is because um, the applicant isn't actually an affordable housing provider it's, a, it's a, a landowner or a landowner's agent working with an affordable housing provider and so the the uh, agreement is there to ensure that um, firstly it comes forward as an affordable scheme so provided by uh, an affordable housing provider and were that not to be the case then the usual required section 106 contributions are made in accordance with the scheme so that is why there is a section 106 on this uh, thank you, Marcus. We haven't had anybody register to speak on this application, so I'm going to move straight into um, debate. Of Councillor Bird. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Thomas has asked me, who is the local member, asked me to um, say a few words on his behalf. Uh, he was unable to come tonight. Uh, he has had an awful lot of concern from his um, uh, um, electorate, uh, who, although... Um, Mike and Marcus say the um, crossing is sufficient, who say they feel very unsafe on a 40 mile an hour road in that very small protected island in the center. And whilst he is not against the um, development in any way, he, he just wonders if we could get some small improvements to that to make safety a little better from this scheme. So on, on, on Councillor Thomas's behalf, I would ask that, is there any way that we could get a, a slight increase of size or improvement to that central crossing island. Thank you. I mean, would would uh, stag would <laughs> would staggering the crossing give uh, any additional capacity? As well, would be a question. I, I, I suppose the difficulty here is that having assessed what's the works that, were, that are there now were done on the basis of the large number of well, say large number of houses. The development that occurred is it thirty five houses I think as part of the previous scheme on the other side of the road um, this is a scheme for obviously a, a, a more housing but not a significantly larger amount of housing and would gen wouldn't generate a significantly greater amount of foot traffic and if it was acceptable for that scheme it's very difficult to, to say it would necessitate any further works for this scheme so um, I can understand the concerns but I under planning uh, policy I couldn't uh, and, and obviously highway safety issues I couldn't say that we would be able to justify it Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Chair. I was just wondering what you mean by 100% uh, affordable. And if you're, you've just mentioned something there, are you concerned that it might not be affordable and that is why you put that? Um, we're, not, we're not concerned it might not be affordable. The, the, um, this would be a relatively standard approach where it's not a um, affordable housing provider that's making the application so we all know that um, the four registered providers in in the Vale are normally Havard, New Ith, um, Wales and West End, what's the other one? United Welsh, there we are. Um, so this is linked to one of those um, but it is it has been made by a landowner stroke um, agent so just to 
give us the comfort because we are obviously accepting a scheme without section 106 contributions to give us that comfort were all of a sudden the scheme to be not an affordable housing scheme um, we could ensure that uh, it it was picked up. Do you want to? Sorry. It? Yeah. It's only to add to that, it's not. It's not that the scheme itself wouldn't be affordable because we could always condition yeah. that it's affordable. The um, the cabinet decision to allow a relaxation on section one hundred six contributions relates to housing built by our four partners, RSLs, or the council. There are other mechanisms by which you can deliver affordable housing. There are other RSLs that don't operate in our area that could come in and buy the site and deliver it as affordable housing. But we would argue that we wouldn't normally apply the relaxation to them because the receipts would not be recycled in the Vale of Glamorgan and contribute to our housing land supply. So it's a deliberate policy choice by the council to allow that relaxation for our partner RSLs that are delivering affordable housing in our area and to facilitate that. It's not a policy choice as a free-for-all to all affordable housing mm. pro providers. So I think we'll see this more and more because we are having other operators bringing forward sites that are not our partner RSLs, and I think that's just the market um, that, that's that's happening now and, and potential other funding streams that are happening with other affordable housing providers. So that's why it is slightly different because it's the first that we've dealt with, but I don't think it'll be the last. Is that okay, Margaret? Yeah. So, okay, Councillor Johnson. Um, and thanks for that explanation there, because I think that's that's quite helpful. Because um, you know, there's an interesting policy choice about our four providers, mm -hmm. and also about ensuring that we have protection, you know, within uh, within this to make sure that that it does fulfil you know, our needs. Um, I was just going to sort of clarify um, just a couple of points. First of all, um, this is this site included within the local development plan, or is it a you know windfall? Um, secondly. Um, with regards to sustainable um, transport, etc., because if the assumption is that if this is a, a low, as an affordable housing site, then presumably that will have the um, the similar uh, assumption of low uh, car usage that we apparently apply everywhere else. Uh, and obviously, this is a, a rural area, so I'm just checking how the sustainable transport um, you know issues have been examined, and also there. I mean, we have made some assumptions there regarding potential section 106. I'm just wondering if there was also thought process went along with what that would be spent on, and if so, where you know that could come from for for this area. Because obviously, if we are having uh, these additional um, costs being put on the local community, for example, through additional children, etc., at the school, then I'm just wondering how those are are going to be dealt with. Marcus, yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Obviously, that conscious decision which Vicky referred to, which is, was taken by Cabinet previously and, and accepted by the Council, was that, that with regard to the affordable housing providers uh, which who are zoned to work in the Vale of the Morgan, um, we, up to a limit of 25 houses, house developments, have taken a conscious decision. We will not be seeking Section 106 contributions from them. And that's purely to allow a maximi maximisation of the social housing grant or other funding stream to generate housing because what happens with social housing if you were to require um, sustainable transport improvements education improvements what have you um, that just comes off the grant that is given to build the housing and means that the uh, basically you're having to find the money one way or another as a council in any event because this is usually on our uh, serving a need that's demanded in the area and because um, we are limiting it to schemes less than 25 houses. It's a bit of a, a, a rule of thumb figure, but the assumption is that we can accommodate schemes of up to that size without, m with minimal impact on things such as education and schooling. Now, the other issue um, which you talked about is the policies which go alongside that, and, and there are policies, clear policies, that firstly allow developments like this, which are solely affordable housing, at the edges of settlements, um, which are outside of normal settlement boundaries, but at the edges of settlements um, where they are solely for housing need and, so, and, the so, and for uh, affordable housing. Um, and this scheme has been judged in accordance with that and, uh, and MD10, which is the LDP policy, which looks at the community s facilities in St. Appen, for example, and, and assumes that the facilities are there for the residents, the future residents of this scheme um, to, to be able to sustainably use without necessarily having to use car transport to get there. So, and in relation to the, the issue of car, obviously they have, this, this scheme does provide what, what we and our highways colleagues consider to be sufficient p 
parking to meet the needs of the scheme, I think I'm right in saying um, this one is pretty close to what a normal scheme would provide in terms of car parking. So there isn't a, map, there isn't a, a big reduction in terms of some, some schemes. You are quite right. We have um, almost to the extent of no parking associated with the scheme. This scheme doesn't do that. Um, you can see from the plan that's on there, um, there is quite, uh, quite a number of parking spaces. So um, it, it has been judged in accordance with all the relevant policies. Um, it is outside of the settlement boundary for St. Athen, but it has been judged against the policy which does allow developments of this nature um, uh, for s affordable housing to be built in locations which are adjacent to or close to the boundary of those settlements. Okay, does that answer the question? I've got a couple of others. You can come back for another bite of the cherry. Um, Councillor Bird. Thank you. Just uh, kind of Ian's question partially answered mine, but just so I understand this correctly, um, if this was not 100% affordable housing, would this have gained planning permission? Is this classed as an exception site? No, it wouldn't have got, I was just confusing ourselves then. It wouldn't have got planning permission because it's, it is an exception site as deemed by the policies in the LDP. So it is in accordance with the LDP. I want to stress that, but it's, it's an exception as defined by the LDP, yeah. <coughs> Councillor Lloyd. Yes, just picking up on um, Councillor Bird's um, uh, point about um, about foot traffic cross, crossing the road. And it's, it looks like a lovely scheme. Um, and I, I, I w I'm working on the assumption that they, they, you know, there will be there will be children um, and families moving into this in, into these houses. Um, I notice that there is, you know, there's provision for for open space. Um, but often with schemes, you know, you, you do see play provision either provided uh, by by the developer or potentially through one or six contributions afterwards. I'm just wondering whether you know the fact that there are likely to be children here with no play provision on site is that going to is that going to mean that children are going to are going to be crossing the road to use play provision elsewhere it's just about that safety aspect again i mean there, uh, you, you're right to point out there is public open space uh, shown at the front of the site there isn't actually play equipment shown on that um the it is true that if you wanted to access uh, the nearest player, but I don't think there is any in the, I, I can't say for sure whether there's any in the housing, the development across the road. I don't think there is. So you would actually have to go across the road to access it in St. Athen. Um, that being said, for a scheme of this size, that would be relatively common. It's, it's a relatively small scheme and it would be extremely difficult to, I mean, they've, I have to be honest, they've got, a very, they've got a larger public open space area than you would normally expect on a scheme of this size if it was a private scheme, for example. Um, so there is a space, as you can see there, you could kick a football about on on the, on the front of the, of the site there. But it's, yeah, it, it's probably not of a size where we would normally expect a, a sort of a, a laid out public open, uh, a laid out play area. That answer your question, Councillor Lloyd? Yeah. Councillor Wilkinson. I was just thinking, I don't think there is a play area in Gilston either, is there? I'm just trying to think. There isn't, is there? But I know the old coal yard. People have a really happy living there, and some of them haven't got cars. And they do go take their children to school and cross there, and they say they can go into the village and get all kinds in the village what they need. But there is two bus stops as well, and they are on both sides, and they say they are quite happy living there they can get everywhere they want to go so it's only across the road the other side councillor johnson just to move officer's recommendation okay um all those in favor of officer recommendations that's carried unanimously thank you um i have no other items on the agenda um thank you very much hope you have a great easter and i'll see you soon thank you